Amen. Let the church say amen. 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 We are here. We're celebrating the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, if you're a guest with us today, I'm glad that you're here. And you are our special guest. And we're going to be in the second chapter of Galatians. And we're studying a book of that, a part of that book where Paul is um, um, defending his apostleship in the gospel. And last week we read and understood a couple of tremendous truths. And one of those is that great leaders can be in error. (laughs) We see that in Peter's life. Um, Peter's two biggest blunders are recorded for us. The first one of denying Christ and the second one of distorting the gospel. But so are all the times where he he was preaching with power and where he was suffering and and, and all the times where he stood strong for the Lord. So we have both of those. Don't write Peter off yet. But the second truth is this, that God's grace means that there are no second-class Christians. Now we need to hear this. We need to hear this in our land. We need to hear this in our nation. That at the foot of the cross, the ground is level. And if Christ makes no distinction, why should we? This is important. See, racism of any brand within any culture is incompatible with the truth of the gospel. Jesus came to die for humanity. For all humanity. God's grace means there are no second class Christians. You know, when we encounter the words justification and righteousness or any of their synonyms... We're not brushing past some obscure biblical um, ideas here. Instead, what we are doing is we are looking at the heart and soul of what it means to be a believer in Jesus Christ. What it means, our standing before God, what, it, what that looks like. And while the Bible emphasizes a, a vast array of subjects, its central message is not changed. The message of the Bible is about how sinful people can be brought into a right standing with God and accepted by Him as righteous. See, that old question stands before us. How can a holy and righteous God accept a sinful person? How does He accept them? And if you ask people, they will tell you, well, I've been a good person. Well, I've tried to keep the Ten Commandments. Well, if the good outweighs the bad, then on that day when I stand before Him, He will allow me to come to heaven. See, people attempt to put themselves into a right standing with God through a lot of different ways. But none of them has or will work out. The only way to a right standing before Almighty God is the way that He has provided through His Son, Jesus Christ. I mean, how can a sinner... How can a sinner be justified? Before God. In chapter 2, we're going to read verses 15 and 16, and I, I want to hone in on that in just a moment. But, you know, if we talk about justification, sometimes people say that to speak of justification by faith, it's a big word, but I'm going to break it down for you. It's a big word that we don't understand, and, and we might. People might say, well, people today don't understand that, Ridge, when you talk about justification by faith. It wasn't any more foreign to those ancient ears than it is to ours. 
We don't understand what we're talking about there. And apart from the gospel, the gospel is what gives that phrase, justification by faith, its significance. I mean, so what does the word justify mean? Think about this. In in our English language, it has several different meanings. And to justify means in one sense, in a very common interpretation, to validate our own position in any controversy. So if somebody calls me on something to justify myself, I'm going to give them the reason for why uh, I, I believe that way or why I've done such and such. And that's what we say. Well, he was just justifying it. Okay, really, when we talk about justifying, it means to justify ourselves, means to make excuses for ourselves, excuses that explain certain activities. Why did you say that? Well, I said that because, and then we begin to make excuses for what we said. So in our society today, the word justify means literally to make excuses for what we've done. (laughs) But you need to understand something. In the Bible, to justify means to declare as righteous. Huge difference. Huge difference in making excuses and being declared righteous. Big difference. We need to understand that just because our society has misappropriated the word justify doesn't mean it's any less what it says in God's word. See, it does not mean to make righteous. When the Bible says that we are justified by faith in Christ, it doesn't mean that we are made righteous. What it means rather is that God has pronounced a verdict of righteousness. He has declared us as righteous. I think this is huge because that is done on the basis of him crediting the merits of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to us. So it's when he puts that, that, that credit to our account, if you will, then we are declared righteous. Nothing that I've done, nothing that you've done, everything that Jesus Christ has done. We are justified by faith. You know, I want to read verse 15. It says Paul is writing and and, um, he is quoting his, his confrontation with Peter. He's writing this letter to the Galatian church and he's talking about a, a confrontation that he had with Peter. And this is what he says. He says, we are Jews by nature and not sinners from among the Gentiles. We are Jews by nature and not sinners from among the Gentiles. Peter, of course, he knew that he was a Jew. Okay? Paul's not saying, you know, he's not being Captain Obvious here. You know, we're Jews, right? He was reminding him of their privileges. Paul was, was, was reminding him of their privileges, the privileges that they had as Jews over the Gentiles. Prejudice. We're better than you. He's reminding them that they are Jews and not Gentiles. And the advantages that they had over what he calls the sinners. And really it means rank sinners. The worst kind. See, what made Gentiles sinners in the estimation of the Jews is that they had not been given the law of Moses. It was given to Israel. No, no, no. It was given to me, my people. Not y'all. It was given to a nation. It was given to Israel. It wasn't given to all the nations. The law of Moses was given to Israel. These Gentiles, these sinners, they didn't have the Ten Commandments. They didn't have all the rules and regulations that regulated the the food that they ate and the clothes that they wore or their their calendar and the, the celebrations and the ceremonies that they went to. They didn't have all the sacrifices and the offerings. You see, the Gentiles, they lived in darkness. They didn't know God. 
because the Israelites had the law of Moses, and so they knew God. They lived, these Gentiles lived in darkness. They lived without the law. So they were called sinners. They lived without the law. This is probably the way that the Orthodox Jews referred to the Gentiles. And Paul was borrowing from their vocabulary here. They were sinners. Gentiles didn't have the advantages of the Jews who had the law, who had the prophets, who had all of the oracles of God. So notice, Paul says in verse 16, Real as these advantages are, great as those advantages were, they didn't save the Jews. And Peter knew that. Paul reminds him of it. He says, Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, since by the works of the law no flesh will be justified. See, it's it's like Paul is saying... Even we, Peter, you and I, we were brought up in the law and we lived under it and we respected it. Even we who held the law in the highest regard, even we didn't seek our justification through it, but through believing in Christ alone. It's in Jesus Christ alone. Notice in that that verse, that one verse Paul says, in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, so that we may be justified by faith in Christ. He uses in Christ three times in one verse. Letting Peter know it's in Christ. It's in Christ. It's not by the law. And so he's asking Peter, so why then are you now trying to impose the law on those people who don't have the law and weren't saved by the law and can't be saved by the law? Why do they need the law? Why is it that important? They have to trust in Christ. So the point that he's making here, and Peter got it, that the law could not save The law of Moses could tell a Jew what to do, but it couldn't make him do it. (laughs) See, the law cannot keep a person from sinning. I know that. Because last year I got a ticket. I was going a little too fast. And you know it too. That's why you're laughing. (laughs) What we see is behind this statement is the acknowledgement that Jews are sinners with the law just as Gentiles are sinners without the law. That's what he's saying. I mean, we're all made of the same stuff. (laughs) I mean, they're are indeed great distinctions among us. Ethnically. We're different from other nations. There's differences in us. We're male and female. We're different in many, many ways. We're different socially. (laughs) But essentially, we're all the same. Because we're all made of the same stuff. And we're all in the same predicament. And each and every one of us is equally needy before God. See, the law of Moses didn't change that. It's inadequate for changing that. It's completely inadequate for establishing a a right relationship between God and, and people. In order to do that, in order to establish a right relationship between God and people, we need a Savior. And that Savior is Jesus Christ. The one who came 
and gave his life for us. See, what we have is the elimination of a ridiculous teaching. I want to call it a barrier. Putting up a barrier so people can't come to Christ. And what Paul is doing is he's taking away that barrier. Notice the Apostle Paul does not negate the practices of the Jews. But he insists that a Gentile convert should not be required to adopt Jewish ceremonial practices in order to become a Christian. Hallelujah. That is good news for all of us. See, the law is designed to show us our sin. When you see it on the red granite out front, it's designed to show us our sin, where we fall short, that we cannot keep God's law. We cannot do it on our own. We need a Savior. See, the the, the Ten Commandments were never designed to give life. The Ten Commandments were designed to show us that we need to be justified. Hmm. Let me illustrate this. I got this glass of water from my house. That water looks pure and delicious. You look at it and it's like, man, it's crystal clear. But what you need to understand is there is filth in that glass. And if I drank what's in there, I'd probably get real sick. Let me tell you where that water came from. That water came from a fountain out in my backyard. Oh, it looks clear. It looks clean. Looks like I might have just poured it out of a water bottle. (laughs) But when you take all the impurities that are in there, this glass represents our hearts. Looks pretty good to me, Ridge. There's not a whole lot in there. You know, looks pretty pure, pretty clean. But the impurities and the stench on the bottom of that glass is not good. This spoon, this spoon is like the law. What the law does is it shows us our sin. And then we begin to see all the junk in our heart. And we recognize we're not right before Almighty God. We've got stuff. We've got stuff to deal with. We've got issues. And it's this way in every human heart. The law, as clean and perfect and clear as it was, stirs up and shows us our sin. And then we know what we need to do about that. Where we need to go for that. See, the law, the law was holy and just and good. But by saying to people, you shall not lie. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not, you shall not, you shall not. What that does is it, the the law acted just like this spoon and it, it stirs up the iniquity and sin that resides in our heart. We read God's word and we recognize, I don't measure up. I have a problem. I've got a sin problem. See, over in Romans chapter 3, verse 20, this is what Paul said. He said, because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. (laughs) Through the law comes the knowledge of our sin. And notice how he is establishing a proper teaching here in verse 16. 
The legal nature, the, the forensic nature of justification here is seen in this declaration of righteousness. Because everything that Paul teaches about salvation, all of this is what he's saying here on justification is drawn from the Old Testament. I mean, Psalm 143, verse 2 says, And do not ju- enter into judgment with your servant, for in your sight no man living is righteous. Folks, that's the teaching of the Old Testament. The law is sufficient to condemn a person, but it's not sufficient to save a person. Okay, so we're sinners. We get it, Ridge. Move on. How do we know that? It's because the law. The stuff in this glass, the spoon didn't cause. The spoon didn't cause all that impurity in there. And the law doesn't cause the sin in your life and mine. We recognize it because of the law. But the sin is there. It's in our flesh. We're fallen creatures. That's where the fault is. We're fallen creatures. It's in our flesh. We're weak and we're unable to perform the laws and obligations that God has set out before us. So here comes the message of the cross, and it comes to light. It's in Christ. It's in the one who died. It's in Jesus Christ. You see, divine justice was satisfied at the cross of Christ. This is the one and only way for God to be just in declaring sinners righteous. Listen, God would be unjust if he forgave your sin and mine apart from what Jesus Christ did on the cross. The only way for sinners to be declared righteous before God is through Jesus. And and it's only in Him when we trust Him and His merits on the cross that we are justified, that we are declared righteous. Listen, everything that the judge of the universe requires of you In order to have right standing before him, he's provided through Jesus Christ. See, all the merits of Christ to justify you before a righteous God are not obtained by the works of the law, but only through putting our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ. He's ready to receive everyone who will come to him by faith alone. See, that kind of faith, The kind of faith that I'm talking about is the kind that moves us away from our own self-interests, our own disobedience. It's It's a faith that denies self. It turns away from sin. Over in Habakkuk, the prophet writes this in chapter 2, verse 4. He says, Behold, as for the proud one, his soul is not right within him, but the righteous will live by faith. Oh, (laughs) this kind of faith, the kind that turns away from sin, the kind that turns away from self-reliance to dependence upon God. This is the kind of faith that follows after Jesus Christ. Fully devoted, fully devoted, we follow him. It's a faith that clings to the cross of Jesus, to him crucified, And to him raised from the dead. So you see, we can't save ourselves. I don't care how good you are. You cannot save yourself on that day. We must be saved. We need a Savior. And the way we receive that is is through an open hand, just like we would receive a gift. We receive Jesus Christ through faith. The same way that Peter did. The same way that Paul did. The same way that you and I do. And it's a matter of grace. So to sum up what Paul's been saying, it's it's plain that righteousness is not from our works. Righteousness comes by faith, implanted by God, in the atoning work of Jesus Christ. See, even our faith itself is a gift from God. Let me put it to you this way. Let's say you had all of your hard-earned money, 
all of this money that you've accumulated, maybe your life savings, whatever it might be, and you had this money in an insolvent bank, okay, a, a bankrupt bank, one that has no money. You've got all your money there and they're broke. Even if you had the greatest amount of faith in that bank, it would not save your money. But if you had the tiniest amount of faith, little itty bitty faith in a solid bank, then your money would be safe. What I'm saying is our solid bank is the merit that is found in Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. Even a tiny amount of faith like that means that your salvation is secure. Chuck Swindoll put it a different way. He said, to us, our best efforts may seem like a sturdy enough staircase to ascend to God. But like rotten wood, they can't hold us. We can't even take the first step toward heaven without it snapping into splinters beneath us. Jesus is our secure staircase. See, we've, we've birthed in him, birthed our penalty in him. We've been born again. When, we've, when we are born again, we put our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ. And so our penalty is now in Him because He is where our little bit of faith, our trust is, is in Jesus Christ, the solid rock. We put our faith in Him. And the tiniest bit of trust in Him means that we have an assurance of everlasting life. It means that, that we have assurance of justification, that we will be declared righteous before Almighty God. Folks, that is what matters. When you leave this place today, you understand Jesus Christ has done it all for you. Put your faith there with Him. See, to refuse to get rid of our human confidence is to insult the grace of God and to undermine or defame the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. I mean, if you're here this morning and you've never acknowledged what Christ did for you, you've never acknowledged Him as your Lord and Savior, you've never put your faith and trust Him in Him, I remind you what also God's Word says is that we are sinners and we're under divine condemnation. I mean, to seek to justify yourself, to declare yourself righteous before Almighty God, there is no one that can do that. Only God can declare you righteous after you accept His Son. After you receive His Son. See, for us to say that we can, well, if the good outweighs the bad, hey, what you're doing is you're, you're basically insulting God. You're insulting His holiness. You're insulting His sacrifice of His Son on the cross for you. You are insulting His wisdom and in effect you are rebelling against the God of the universe. But if you know your sin, if you know your guilt, and you come before Him broken, and you say, I need a Savior. Folks, He accepts that. He accepts that as trusting in the merit of Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. You see, if you come to God through Christ and cling to him and what he has done, you're safe now and forever. Declared righteous through the blood of Jesus Christ. Folks, I am so thankful. I am so thankful for God's provision 
for a sinner like me.